Chinese doctor uh, for years. Uh, the previous appointment was at OPAC, and then I went on to, uh, to Harvard. So my uh, foundational, let's say, focus on the Gulf energy sectors on natural gas production, in particular, I look at how this uh, coming wave of unconventional gas is going to impact the region in terms of uh, development, in terms of uh, economic diversification, and what have you. So if you can please just indulge me, if you can bear with me, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a broad picture of where the Gulf uh, gas sector is uh, at the moment, and then what we can expect uh, going forward, let's say into 2020, and why this is going to be important uh, for all of you. So I'm just going to give a broad overview of this, and then I'm just going to give you a picture of what to expect within the region, uh, of course, utilizing the different examples uh, from uh, GCC uh, member countries. So first of all, what I'd like us to do, just to uh, engage, we can see a type of uh, thought experiment. Now, what is this thought experiment? In 1977, the Gulf region began to export natural gas. And that was actually here in Abu Dhabi, and exported that natural gas to uh, Temco, uh, to uh, Japan, to uh, Tokyo, and the power company. And this was in 1977. 30 years later, there's been a revolution, actually, within the natural gas sector in the region. This revolution means that in 2009, the region began to import natural gas. And this was when Kuwait imported natural gas in 2009, uh, during the summer to meet its peak demand. So the question, actually, that most of you are going to have to consider is, how did the region transition from being an energy export region that had no need to depend upon any other place in the world for its energy to having to import energy? And actually, Kuwait is importing LNG from Shell's international portfolio, actually coming from as far afield as Russia, Saturday, Phil, and from Australia. So if you can just take a picture of the region right now, you can see that there are LNG ships passing each other in the night with LNG going from Qatar, going to East Asia, and then coming from, let's say, Australia or Russia, going to the region as well, passing each other in the silent night. I mean, so this, I think, is a bit of a contradiction. And what I'm going to get into during my presentation is to how this has developed and to the role of conventional gas plays in that. And in particular, to the role that sour gas is going to play in this type of uh, uh, reconfiguration natural gas sector and why this is going to be important to all of you as corrosion specialists. What I'd like to do is just uh, give a brief overview of the Gulf uh, gas sector. Of course, most of you are quite uh, cognizant uh, of these figures, but uh, you know, the Great Big Gulf region is home to some of the largest uh, natural gas reserves uh, in the world. It holds roughly a quarter of the global total of natural gas reserves. So we can see here that, uh, well actually let me, uh, let me uh, state that, even though it holds, uh, let's say, a significant amount of natural gas uh, in terms of our reserves, there's very little production in, in terms of its potential. It's only about 8%. And, and I think that this is actually uh, a bit uh, problematic because the region has such extensive natural gas reserves, but at the same time, uh, very little uh, production. So I mean, I think that this is uh, a very essential issue to understand the reasons as to why that is. We can see here that Qatar is one of the dominant, uh, dominant uh, GCC countries in terms of natural uh, gas, uh, which actually within the region, within the GCC itself, it uh, has, uh, it's number one, uh, but uh, if we count Iran, Iran would be uh, number one in terms of uh, the greater uh, Arabian Gulf uh, region, and uh, so on. We can see Saudi Arabia, which is uh, number two, UAE, three, four, just within the Gulf. Region. So I'm going to discuss the reasons as to why there is this uh, natural gas uh, supply demand imbalance and the role that conventional gas is going to play into it. So number one, one of the main factors for the supply demand imbalance in the region has been this uh, unparalleled wave of industrialization that has occurred within the region uh, that has uh, placed extreme pressure on the domestic power and gas demand. So if we look at a period of about uh, 10 years or so, let's say a decade, from 1998 to 2008, 
we can see that the GCC economies uh, grew at approximately a rate of 7.6% per annum. And then we can see, of course, whenever there's economic growth, we can see that uh, demand growth in terms of power and natural gas receives a pace as well. And this is this was true for anywhere in the world. So if we look at uh, during the same period, we have a gas demand growing at approximately 5.5%. Uh, and then we also have, uh, let's say, power demand uh, throughout the same period growing at about 6.2%. Uh, so if we consider, let's say, certain reputable forecasts, uh, let's say the US uh, Energy Information Administration forecasts that uh, for a period until uh, today, until about 2030, uh, the power requirements of the region are going to increase about 50%. Uh, so currently, the power requirements of uh, the region are about 710 terawatt hours, and that is predicted to increase to about 1,100 terawatt hours by 2030. And more than 90% of this increase is going to be fulfilled by what? By natural gas, of course. Now, there are certain projects to delve into renewable energy and renewable energy and what have you, but natural gas is going to be the driver for this increase. And if you look at even the UAE as an example, 98% of the power generation within the, this country, within the UAE, is fulfilled by uh, natural gas. I mean, so we can see that any type of economic growth in the future, any type of growth in power and, uh, in, in power and also water desalination, it's going to be driven by the natural gas molecule, and where is that going to come from, and how is this going to be expedited? Uh, these are uh, key uh, questions. And then uh, if we also look at uh, one of the second uh, factors that uh, played uh, quite a significant role uh, in terms of our regional gas uh, demand, uh, this has been the government will focus on economic diversification modernization, particularly within uh, the energy-intensive industries. Uh, so if we look at energy-intensive industries, I mean, the UAE is a very good example of that because we have uh, cement industries, and we have uh, also the UAE, uh, there are, are uh, steel smelting, aluminum smelting, and what have you. So it requires a significant amount of uh, energy uh, to fuel all of these uh, projects as well. And there's also been a governmental focus on uh, petrochemical and fertilizer uh, expansion as well because the GCC wants to capture this uh, global market. Uh, so this has been another uh, factor within a region placing an increasing burden on the natural gas sector, which uh, the sector really hasn't been able uh, to keep up. And just to give a type of uh, example, uh, within the UAE, uh, gas production uh, is about uh, 50 BCM or so uh, per annum. Uh, where is the consumption at? Well, consumption is at about 60 BCM uh, per annum. So that means that there's a 10 BCM shortfall well, within the region. So how is that being met? Well, I mean, to a certain degree, some of that is being met by the Dolphin natural gas uh, pipeline, of course. And then there's also LNG import in the, in the region as well. Uh, but this uh, imbalance is actually slated to increase uh, going forward. And then the third major factor as to this uh, imbalance has been gas exploration and production uh, challenges. Uh, so one, in the wake of the global economic crisis, uh, there has been uh, there have been OPEC quotas, uh, obviously. Now this, of course, has uh, weakened a bit. Uh, there's been more flexibility. But in 2008, uh, OPEC quotas were uh, initiated. And then why is this important uh, for the gas sector within the region? Because the majority of the natural gas in the region is produced from associated gas fields. So if you put oil production quotas on your uh, oil uh, fields, and that means that obviously your associated natural gas production is going to uh, decrease. Uh, so that has been a factor. And then there have also been issues with finding natural gas. Uh, so uh, in terms of just being able to find the gas, uh, some GCC countries have been uh, experiencing difficulty with that. In particular, if we look at uh, Saudi Arabia uh, with its Rugal uh, al gas initiative uh, within the empty quarter. Uh, gas has been quite difficult to, uh, to find there. And the gas that has been found has been uh, quite a sour, and the production cost is uh, a lot higher. Then also the weight has had similar issues. And then also within that, uh, let's say, type of uh, the sub-factor, you can say, is uh, the gas that has been found has been technically challenging gas. So that means that the gas is not easy to produce. And hence, this is why all of you uh, are here. But uh, there are immense technical challenges with producing from the new, unassociated, unconventional. Uh, so there's sometimes.
type of uh, disconnect, a dissonance uh, between these two, and that's actually one of the driving forces behind that. And then there's also been, uh, the fourth factor has been uh, mature uh, oil fields in the need for EOR, so this has been another huge consumption factor uh, within the region and within the UAE itself. About 18 BCM per year goes to uh, enhanced oil recovery, 18 BCM per year, and that's slated to actually increase uh, until 2020 to reach about uh, 40 uh, BCM or so. I mean, so, I mean, this is actually an enormous consumption central within the region for EOR, but there have been certain uh, let's say initiatives to uh, try to uh, go into either utilize polymers or to utilize uh, carbon or nitrogen or what have you for EOR. And then lastly, Another constraint on the natural gas sector in the region has been uh, export contracts. Uh, so these long-term export contracts that uh, place constraints on the region to be able to redirect some of this natural gas to its own domestic requirements. So if you look at uh, Abu Dhabi or the UAE as an example, uh, the UAE exports natural gas, but at the same time it imports uh, natural gas. And this also uh, happened, this is actually happening in Oman as well. So there's export and import. And the thing is that these uh, export contracts have been signed uh, before the natural gas uh, shortage happened in earnest. So as a result, you can't uh, necessarily break these contracts. So most of these contracts uh, in the region for export are going to last until about 2019, 2018, 2019. Uh, so extremely difficult to get out of them. And uh, as a result of the region now, Dubai is importing uh, LNG. And this is actually going to increase Dubai's dependence on LNG is going to uh, increase uh, for the future. So we have this scenario of export and import actually from some of the very same countries, so not to even mention, let's say, the Dolphin Project. So these are the major issues that are impacting the GCC uh, gas sector. And as of yet, there is no comprehensive strategy uh, to deal with this. And there hasn't really been, uh, across uh, the GCC, there has not been, let's say, a cogent, comprehensive, concise, rational strategy that has been developed to be able to meet the needs of these countries uh, for their future development, and for their future economic modernization and diversification. And just as an example, let's say how Saudi Arabia is meeting the challenge is burning crude oil. Uh, so about 50% of its production, uh, its production is from uh, crude oil. So uh, these are uh, major, major issues uh, within uh, the region, but to discuss unconventional gas and how it's important for all of you here is that uh, the way that the region is dealing with the natural gas shortage, or shortages actually, is through two primary methods. One way is through import, either through LNG or let's say through the Dolphin pipeline, and the uh, second way is through indigenous gas production. Indigenous gas production, principally in the region, is going to come from uh, sulfurous gas fields. So about 50% of the new gas fields within the region are composed of what you could call sour gas. I mean, so this is going to uh, place immense challenges in terms of the region to be able to uh, try to encourage or attract an investment while still having this extremely low pricing structure in terms of uh, the in terms of the price it supplies the natural gas to its domestic uh, sectors, and then the cost of production as well. So the international oil companies are a bit loath to get involved in terms of production of, this, uh, of these new unconventional gas fields uh, in the region uh, because of this type of discrepancy between the domestic pricing and uh, the production cost. Because you know that when you produce from uh, unconventional uh, natural gas fields, you know that the production cost is going to be several fold higher than the current uh, pricing structure. And as of yet, there really has been no type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, desire to change this pricing structure. So that's why there's actually been, uh, the region has actually delayed quite a bit in terms of uh, maximizing its potential. That's why we have 25% of the global total of, uh, of global gas reserves is within the region, and 8% uh, is being produced in terms of the global production uh, rate. So we can say that more or less, this is the hour of sour gas. I mean, this is, this is where we're at right now, and actually this is going to increase for the future. The thing is, there has to be a critical awareness of how to create the type of infrastructure to be able to produce this gas, to be able to transport this gas, and to be able to process this gas, because the issue of corrosion is going to be a 
U.S. and uh, the, nat in the natural gas sector for the Gulf region going forward because we can expect that the majority uh, of new gas production within the region is going to be composed uh, of this uh, extremely sulfurous uh, natural gas. So well, what we have here, for instance, uh, within Abu Dhabi, you can see that Abu Dhabi has attempted to uh, produce from uh, the Shah gas field in order to increase its indigenous uh, production. And uh, the Shah gas field is an immense undertaking. It's about a 10 to $12 billion uh, project, a mega project actually within uh, the region. And uh, it is estimated when it comes online about 2015, 2016, to uh, produce about uh, 28 uh, million cubic uh, meters uh, per uh, day of sour raw gas. And again, as I indicated, we have about rates of 25% uh, hydrogen sulfonate and about 2% carbon dioxide. So highly contaminated uh, natural gas. And this is actually one of the major fields that the UAE is depending upon in order to meet uh, its uh, future gas uh, consumption uh, growth. And then also if we look at uh, some of the other, a bit more marginal fields uh, within uh, the UAE, uh, we have, uh, they're also quite uh, softwares as well. So if we look at, uh, for instance, the Bab uh, Ben Ben Thamen field, uh, this is uh, quite uh, softwares of the onshore field, and also the Hale field as well, which is offshore. And uh, they are uh, predicted to produce about 14 million cubic meters uh, per uh, day. And again, as I indicated, uh, quite softwares. Now if we look at Saudi Arabia, as an example, Saudi Arabia has been experiencing immense challenges in terms of meeting its, uh, its demand growth within Saudi Arabia. Uh, there have been some successes. Uh, for instance, uh, Khalid al Falah, who is now uh, the new CEO of uh, Aramco, he comes from the gas strategy division, uh, for example. So he comes with a very keen insight as to how to maximize production of natural gas within the kingdom. And uh, now, actually, uh, 2011, I'd say, was the first time that the kingdom produced uh, more unassociated natural gas than associated natural gas. So, I mean, I think this is quite an accomplishment, but still uh, significant challenges in the kingdom going uh, forward. Uh, if you look at the offshore Karen uh, field, uh, this again is uh, quite uh, sulfurous, and uh, the kingdom has uh, focused on this as being one of the first unassociated natural gas fields uh, that are in our production within the kingdom. And basically, the kingdom. Saudi Arabia has uh, created a type of uh, subsea pipeline in order to transport the natural gas uh, to, or and actually quite sour gas to the, on, to the onshore uh, Khorsaniya uh, facility for treatment. And then also Saudi Arabia has a joint venture with uh, Shell at the same time in order to uh, expedite production from the Kidan uh, field, uh, which has had uh, success in terms of a preliminary uh, development. And uh, Shell and uh, Saudi Arabia have, uh, let's say, considered that uh, there is a fair, uh, let's say, amount of uh, potential for success in terms of extracting this uh, commercially. If you look at uh, some of the other GCC members and their attention that has been given to sour gas developments, uh, uh, Qatar, for instance, we all know the gas moratorium on the North Field, which has been extended, I would say, perhaps about three times, and I think the base extension is about uh, 2015, 2016, uh, if my memory serves me uh, correctly. Uh, so as a result, uh, there's really no uh, expectation that there's going to be uh, further uh, natural gas uh, development or increased natural gas production from the North Field. Uh, but at the same time, there, is, there have been other uh, natural gas projects within uh, Pato, such as the Barzan Field. The Barzan Field uh, is another uh, sour field, and uh, that is actually going to be slated for uh, domestic uh, power and uh, desalination needs of uh, Qatar. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the perspectives of Qatar is that once uh, the sour gas load of Barzan is online and running, it should be able to produce about uh, 1.7 uh, million cubic meters uh, per day. Uh, Oman has been trying to branch out extensively in terms of uh, producing its uh, sour gas uh, patrimony. And uh, it has started to invest uh, significantly into much of its uh, sour gas projects, and has attempted to bring online about seven, about excuse me, eleven uh, uh, unconventional uh, gas fields on stream over the uh, coming uh, five years. And this also includes the Hazan Makado uh, field, and also some deep uh, gas fields within the south of the country.